All right, so this is a lecture, I will call this lecture for your notes, uh, the American Revolution Part 2. I conceive these, this lecture to being a three-part series, and I think it will be a three-part series uh, on the American Revolutions. This is Part 2. One of the uh, themes that I keep hitting on in class with you is, is that uh, for most of the American Revolution, it isn't actually a set of glorious, vic glorious victory after glorious victory after glorious victory. In fact, uh, the American Revolution is oftentimes uh, really not that uh, uh, happy of a time for, in American history. It, it, it seems to be one episode after another after another. And so uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the American Revolution here in 1776, uh, we should remember, uh, or we pick up in 1775, now 1776, we're going to enter into a time period where it looks like this thing's going to fail. It really does. We're going to have the invasion of Canada fail spectacularly, and the only thing that was good out of it was, put this man's name in your notes, he'll show up several times a day, Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold. And you would not think, listening to somebody say Benedict Arnold was a good thing, trust me, you'll get the feeling, uh, you'll get both of him. Benedict Arnold is a very complicated man. He's not a good man, and he's, but he's very complicated, like most people are at their core. Uh, but uh, he is about the only thing that good comes out of that Canadian invasion. We try to take can Canada. It fails. And quite honestly, it fails a second time in the War of 1812. We could have, been, uh, we could have had the can uh, Canadians, but alas, we don't. So that fails. But where we really need to pick up our uh, story is now in the summer of 1776. Summer of 1776. The Continental Congress in the first half of 1776, up and through July 4th of that year, the Continental Congress was actually made up of still good men who were uh, of quality. That won't be the case as the war drags on, and by the end of the war, I'll make a very definite point to you that the Continental Congress, that ruling body that is the lawmaking and governing part of the American Federation or Confederation, the Continental Congress is not very good at the end of the war. It's made up of a bunch of zeros and nobodies, and people who had no talent or ability. But by the time you get, uh, but you, here you are in 1776, it still is made up of men worthy of the uh, title great men. Uh, you still have the Sam Adamses. You still have the Benjamin Franklins. You still have the Thomas Jeffersons and the John Adamses. And importantly, though, by the time you get to the summer of 76, the Continental Congress starts to move. Up until this point in time, up until the year, and really up until the springtime of 76, there was always a faction within the Continental Congress that had resisted the allure of independence, had resisted the word of independence, and frankly decided uh, were, were dragging their heels. The Adamses out of Massachusetts, uh, Franklin out of Pennsylvania, Jefferson out of uh, Virginia, and, and others are going to be in favor of independence in 1775. But sometimes you can't rush the baking of a, uh, of a foodstuff. You can't rush the baking of, of, of bread or the cooking of barbecue. In the same sort of way, sometimes you can't rush the politics. You may want to, but the w wiser choice is to let the, uh, the process work itself out. It, it sounds like a coach talking right now. Coach says, we've got to let the process work out. We're just going to pull the ho cord or however coach talks today. But anyways, all of which is to say is, is that the, thing, the situation on the ground in the American colonies, by the time you get to the spring of 1776, and more especially the smoke signals and the communications the Congress was receiving from England, indicated uh, time and time and time again that there was not going to be some sort of great uh, reconciliation. There was not going to be an olive branch uh, put forth by the parliament. In fact, actually, there was uh, parts of the Continental Congress that did, offered an olive branch to the, the British Parliament, and the British Parliament slapped it away. And basically, was going. To, the feeling in Britain was at that time in '75 and now '76, we have got to bring the colonies to heel. What it does is it radicalizes and. As you watch your life, I don't know what, to, by the way, I'm going to say this. Let me pause myself because I don't want this recorded. They, uh, the thing is, is that 
the Continental Congress, as the year progresses, especially for those who are trying to be moderate on the issue of independence, meaning they weren't for it, they were perhaps for Commonwealth status, uh, such as like Canada is, those individuals are being radicalized by the parliament. They're being radicalized by British actions in North America to the point where by the time you get to July of 76, July 4th obviously is the date, you're ready for independence. And so you're going to have several weeks in June and you're going to have Jefferson writing the document. Jefferson in his own right is not a great speaker, but he is a great thinker and he's a pretty good writer. And, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, that opening line, that famous opening line of the Declaration of Independence. Probably the Declaration of Independence can be said like this in your notes. The, the gold cup or the golden apple of, the, uh, of America. The Declaration of Independence could be said that way. Uh, and I'm not the one who's saying it. It's actually was Abraham Lincoln who uh, compared it to that way. He said that is the gold standard by which we define ourselves as Americans. Uh, in fact, actually, Jefferson, he was very proud of that, uh, of the things that he did in his life. And Jefferson did a lot. If you look at Jefferson's tombstone, he had about three things mentioned on it. Declaration of Independence, uh, the Rights of Man, and the University of Virginia. He admit, omitted the fact that he was president of the United States, that being Jefferson. But anyways, Jefferson was very, he never forgave uh, John Adams and, and Benjamin Franklin for editing his beloved declaration. Jefferson starts out with the words, we hold these truths to be sacred, which smacks of the pulpit. And uh, the, the skeptic Franklin is going to say, no, 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 let's pull it back. But that's the high point, in a sense, of all of the things we can say about 1776. This is the high point. The Declaration of Independence are declaring our independence and trying to make it so. And it only takes another six years to get it done. It only takes another, actually, I say that, 76, it is seven years to get it done. The fact of the matter is, is that this is the high point on an otherwise dark and gloomy year. But as we move forward... And we will see these uh, great men in the Continental Congress leave it. John Adams becomes a diplomat. Thomas Jefferson becomes a governor. Benjamin Franklin becomes a French diplomat. We'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. But in, the Amer in 1776, the real story is Washington. And as I said to you, and I will reiterate several more times today, the whole key to the American Revolution is going to end up being this basic fact. For us to win it. For us to win it. Uh, or at least not to lose it, and that's the important thing, is that Washington cannot be caught. Washington the man cannot be captured. Washington the man cannot be killed. And I don't mean that like he cannot physically be killed. It must not happen is what I mean. If Washington the general is captured, killed, or something else, but knocks him out of commission, it is very likely that the American Revolution fa fails and falls apart. And I believe I touched on the fact last time that Washington was uh, seemingly impervious to bullets. Uh, bullets never found him. But uh, when we say Washington the man, not only can he not be uh, captured or caught, that can't be allowed to happen. The same can be said about his army. That Continental Army that served under Washington in many respects, like the man himself, was the symbol of the Revolution far more than the Declaration and far more than the Continental Congress. So if you ever hear the question asked, and it is, it's not a wrong question uh, to ask, and it's not this answer I'm about to give isn't necessarily wrong either. Who, who won the American Revolution? And the answer often has come back in our history, well, George Washington did. And I think that's, uh, in a sense, right. Nobody else was that indispensable, and he was the indispensable man. But Washington is not a great man for his military prowess, at least not initially. I, I don't think he's that great of a, a general at times. In fact, early in the war, he's frankly a bad general. I'd write that down. He makes mistakes. He puts himself on the line where he should not have, he should not have exposed himself to bullets like he does because he doesn't know that he's going to live, and he needs to stay alive. But more particularly, though, the problem Washington has is that he is a fighter. Fundamentally, he likes the sting of battle. We talked about the bullets uh, and the, the, the enjoyment of battle in the last uh, lecture. Fundamentally, Washington is a fighter who not only likes the feel of battle, he is a sort, mark this down, who runs to combat, who runs to battle. 
when he hears the bullets uh, fly. He hears the cannon boom. He is drawn to it. Most men aren't. I will assume Brandon's not. I'm going to assume uh, Colby's not. I'm going to assume Bryant is. Well, he's got a Calvert Fire Department hat. Maybe he runs to the fire instead of running away from it. But most people, and I'm not trying to throw stones at Brandon or Reagan or Dustin or myself or whatever, but most people have to be trained to run, uh, to not flee when they hear the bullets whiz and when they hear the cannon boom. Most people have to be trained that way They had to overcome the, the paralyzing fear or at least the, uh, the, the, the instinct to flee or fly. Washington was not that sort of man. And in August of 1776, so August of 76, we find Washington and his army in New York City, and more particularly on Long Island. If you know your geography of that part of the world, Maybe you've been up there several times. But if you know that geography of that part of the world, Washington uh, is in a perilous position. Uh, the thing is, is that when Washington uh, is in a perilous position and he doesn't quite understand uh, his predicament, the problem is, is that if you're out on Long Island, if you're out in that exposed territory, you have exposed your army. And it's the biggest army. It perhaps is the best army the Americans have. You've exposed yourself to uh, short, excuse me, from to ship bombardment from the British Navy. The British Navy is going to come in force, and they're going to drop off and uh, disembark thousands and thousands of redcoats, and they're going to be flowing onto the island. They're going to be flowing into New York, and Washington's twenty thousand men aren't ready for what's coming at them. And they're exposed. They have no way. If they get caught on Long Island, it's over. That's the problem with being on an island. It sounds great, looks great. You got the, the, the city, New York City. But if you get caught, you get captured, you get cut off, you're done. It's like being in the Alamo. It's romantic to talk about the, but the Alamo itself was a death trap. I mean, you can talk about that more later in a Texas history class. The thing, though, is, is that uh, Washington, to all of what I sing the Hallelujah Chorus about the man, this was not his shining moment. This is not his glorious moment. This is not, to use Theodore Roosevelt's phrase, his crowded hour. It's not. Washington in, uh, what was, in uh, seven, June, uh, August of 1776 is not just the only man who's got problems. Put this in your notes. The men are led poorly. You have officers who are complacent, officers who are political hacks, officers who should never have been let anywhere near uh, combat or the leadership of men. They make elementary mistakes that uh, others would never do, such as, put this in your notes, they would make mistakes such as, well, forgetting to put up the security. Security. Putting up the, the security guard, making sure approaches and roadways are blocked, that you cannot be surprised. And that was ultimately and always seemingly the problem in Long Island and Manhattan Island here in August of 76, is we find the Americans habitually surprised. And it's not a good surprise. It's not a surprise party. It's a surprise destruction, uh, excuse me, a potentially surprising destruction of the army. And so what Washington uh, does uh, is where you about August uh, 15th or so, you find the Continental Army shattering. Use that word in your notes, shattering, cracking, fragmenting, breaking up. Washington's lines are in disarray. Washington's army is uh, fragmenting all over Long Island. And the biggest problem Washington has is that he has no intelligence. He has no information. I mean, it, it, I say Bry uh, Bryant with that Calvert fire hat on. Uh, you want to have, before you go charging into a burning building, you want to make sure you have some sort of idea what you're charging into, right? You don't want to just go help it into a, a, an inferno. You've got to know something. And Washington is blind. I don't mean that literally, but he has no intelligence. He has no information. And so here we are, and this is where I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to pause the recording, and I want your uh, uh, feedback when I ask for it. But here's the question I'm posing to you, is what would you do if in, the, in a dire moment, and so dire that many individuals within the officer corps themselves are thinking, this thing's lost. I'm going to be doing good to save my neck, let alone save the Army. We're going to... What do you do when Washington goes around the room and he asks, he says, uh, will anyone go undercover? 
as a spy? Will anyone go undercover and go after uh, and get me intelligence, get me information about what's going on? Give me numbers. I need information. And oh, by the way, so we're extremely, extremely clear when I ask this question of you, what would you do? If you get caught undercover as a spy, you will be executed. You will either be stood on a wall and shot or you will be hung. There's no due process. That's a, there's no, uh, well, I've got rights. No, that's not going to be the case here. That was, that was, even today, that's not the case. So let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and hit my pause button for just a Have you uh, lied, uh, before, lied to the country? And he said, oh, yes, I have. And I will tell more, many more lies before this war is over. Uh, Churchill also made the remark once he said, uh, you know, um, the truth is oftentimes uh, protected by a bodyguard full of lies. But anyways, it's, uh, Churchill could be awfully uh, c- cynical at times too. But not Hale. Nathan Hale, he's dressed as a teacher, but the problem for him is, is he, he's too conspicuous. The British, they have counter, counterintelligence officers wandering around trying to find out Hale and trying to find out other spies that may be working for, um, for Washington or for the American rebels. The thing is, is that Hale... Is, uh, is, or the thing is, hell, is he's going to start writing down numbers. It would be like I've got my, uh, my pad here, and now he doesn't literally pull a pad out and start writing, but hell will. He's, he's basically giving away that he's trying to figure out how many British soldiers are landing along the coast of, the, of Long Island, New York. And the British pick him out just like that. So ultimately what ends up happening is as the British, they send a couple, a couple of these counterintelligence agents, uh, start sidling up to him and following him, and they, they go to Hale that first night while he is undercover. They catch him at a bar. Hale's not a drunk. I don't want to make it sound like Hale's just going getting blitzed. He's not. But he has uh, a few drinks. And some of you know this for a fact. What happens when you drink? You know, the secret key to the, to the secrets of the heart and the secrets of the mind, the, the key to the whole operation sometimes is alcohol, and that flies open. Some of you got friends that way. They'll tell you everything you didn't want to know. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, Hale's not drunk. He's just loosened up, and he's too trusting. That's another problem. He's too conspicuous, and he's too trusting, and he lets the cat out of the bag, and the next day Hale is picked up, and Hale will be arrested and shortly thereafter, he will be executed. When he is executed, he famously, Hale is famously, he's got his, he's blindfolded, uh, hands behind his back sort of thing, and they will uh, ask him, do you have any last words? And he says, I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. And Hale was a bit of an actor as well. He, had a, uh, he was a bit of a thespian, I think is the right word for that. But the fact is, is that he, he enjoyed that. He, he said that, and it goes down in American history. One of the, the great line from one of the worst spies we've ever had. To his credit and to his memory, the man stuck his neck out when others didn't. Did it change the war? Not really. But if you ever go to Langley, Virginia, where the CIA is headquartered, uh, I have this on good authority from a man who worked at the CIA for a career. Uh, if, by the way, if you ever get a chance to take a, a course with a guy at A&M named Jim Olson, Jim Olson probably be about, 50, six, about 70 or 75 by now, but Jim Olson uh, was counterintelligence C- chief in the CIA, amongst other things, and he's, he's now retired over at A&M. Best, one of the best classes I ever took was uh, Olson. And I, ha- I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. I've, it's, uh, the, I've heard it various ways. It's, I've seen it give as well. But uh, I've also seen it lose too. It's probably a little bit, uh, it could be the one, uh, Daniel. The thing is, is that as far as Olson is concerned, uh, that's where I heard this story initially. And of course, I've read more since then. But uh, he talked about this fact, though, is that there's a statue of Hale in the CIA. And uh, it's just kind of in a, in a contemplative garden. They've got his statue right there in the, the quote. The thing is, is that uh, when you talk about hell, is, is it's a warning for everybody who gets into the espionage and intelligence business. If you go undercover and you become a case officer, well, guess what? You too uh, might meet the fate of 
like a Nathan Hale or many of the others. But Washington, by the way, let me say this. Washington is going to be one of the best spy masters in the history of the United States. Where you start out poorly here in the example I just gave you, Washington, when it's all said and done, is going to employ during the war uh, maybe hundreds, but certainly uh, 50-plus different spies, and he acted as his own spy master. Washington will have them use uh, invisible ink, codes, uh, ciphers, and all those sorts of fun things like that. And Washington ran these spies left and right. Most of them were men. Some of them were women. And the thing is, is worth noting, too, with Washington, please put this in your notes, it's not that Washington was always trying to glean the most intelligence about his enemy. A lot of times he will use his spies and his spy networks to, uh, to give disinformation to the British, to, uh, to make the British think that he was stronger than he really was to make the British think that there were 10,000 active and hungry, not hungry like in a famished way, but ready to fight Americans. Uh, the American army wasn't in that bad a shape, where in fact, actually, at times you will see the American army have 2,000 effective individuals. And so that was what Washington's goal was with that, uh, uh, spying. Uh, and as the war drags on, Washington is going to use espionage to keep him out of battle. And that's really ultimately another uh, big aspect of it. The, the use of spies and uh, intelligence keeps Washington out of combat as much as it gets him into the right combat. So, anyways, all of which is to say Nathan Hale fails. I mean, he's gone. The reason Washington and his army get off of Long Island and get off of Manhattan Island is probably more divine providence than it is anything else, in my opinion. It, if it's not divine providence, he, is a, he, Washington, is one of the luckiest men that ever walked this earth. And the reason I say that is there are times where it looks like the American army is about to be uh, rolled up and destroyed. Yet somehow, some way, they're able to get off of the island, get out of Manhattan, and get onto the mainland of New York. And it saves them time and time again. But it's still a disaster. The American army in August of 1776 starts out with about 18,000 men, men, and by the time they get onto the mainland, they're down to about 8,000 men. That's a horrible, horrible uh, attrition rate. And they're not all dead, mind you. A lot of them are captured, surrender, run for the hills, whatever. But it's not good. And, and that's the thing to remember. It is simply, it's simply not good at all. Um, the year only gets darker. The year only gets darker as you get to the, the end of the year. What was the, uh, Randall Kelly was asking, what was the first number? About 18,000. And it goes down to about 8,000 by the time you get to December 76. Um, and so as I keep saying that perhaps this is almost a miracle, uh, it's December 1776, there's really very little hope, quite honestly. And I don't mean that in some sort of uh, breezy statement of hope. There really isn't much. Part of the problem you've got by the time you get to December of 76 is the American army is not only uh, got pro uh, fractured problems, but more particularly, men are running, men are leaving. You know as well as I do, there are always those folks who are going to be, stay in the, with the team as long as things are good or okay. But things go sideways, go bad, people jump off the proverbial bandwagon right quick some trying to save their own necks. By the time you get to December of 1776, you're looking at an American army that has no more than 5,000 soldiers. And of that 5,000 soldiers in December of 76, of those 5,000, only about 2,500, 2,500, only about 2,500 are able to take up arms. Others are sick. You've had a lot of desertions. You've had a lot of runaways. And last but not least, the coup de grace would be this, is, is that at the end of the year, many of the men in that what's left of the Continental Army under Washington, they can go home. They enlisted for a year. They enlisted for nine months. They enlisted for whatever their term was. But for many of those men, seemingly about a third of the men, they could go home at the end of the year. And at some point, the gig's up. You've got to keep people in the army. They can't keep running away. They can't keep uh, deserting. They can't keep going home legally. You've got to get them to stay. Enter your notes, one of the worst men in American history.
And I mean that in a moral sense. Boy, this sounds like uh, Madison's like, what? I got the worst spy, now I got the worst man. What's going on around here? The thing is, I'm talking about, um, oh gosh, what's his name? Thomas Paine. Tom Paine. You talk about a fellow that if you met him once, you met Tom Paine once, you didn't like him. He's not, uh, some of you already have a friend like this, and I use this term friend, and it may be literally a friend or somebody you know, but he's hard to be a friend to. I'm just kind of looking at your reaction. Some of you know what I'm, is, because with all the blank sp uh, spaces out there, maybe not. But I would imagine a couple of you've got a friend that, uh, especially if there's alcohol involved, but even if there's not, he's, his personality is dyspeptic. And pain was that way. He attacked friends. He attacked enemies. He was a perpetual attack dog. He fails at everything he does in life. He's a bad husband. He's a bad family man. He's a bad businessman. He's bad. Not, uh, not to mention his uh, personality. I'll give you an example. When he moves to America from England in the early 1770s, he comes and he sets up shop. I believe it was in Philadelphia, but he sets up shop as a dance instructor. Now you're saying, dance instructor? Twinkle toes? He had no experience as a dance instructor, and he fails at that. And he couldn't figure out why. But for all of his faults, and my gosh, he's got them. He is one heck of a writer. All of his faults, he's a writer. That man commands the English language as well in his element and in his way. He commands it as well as William Shakespeare, Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln. And I'm not being over the top when I say it like that. I am not being hyperbolic. I'm not trying to say, oh my gosh, he's picking the word. No, Paine is one of the best writers in the history of the English language. And he happens to be a friend and a faithful patriot at this point in his life. He pins these famous words. These are the times that try men's souls. The sunshine patriot and, and so forth and so on. The, these are the times that try men's souls. That's Tom Paine, and he writes it in December of 1776. The story goes, and it might be apocryphal, but it might be true, so we don't know, so I'll tell it. He writes this story when he is uh, in the camp, there in that, those dark days of December 76. He writes those words trying uh, on the top of a drum, trying to convince men to stay in the army. It works. It works. So you get a piece of good news. People re-up for the duration. Two. You have two little victories in New Jersey. Trenton and Princeton. Two little victories in New Jersey in December, seven, uh, basically Christmas Eve, December of 76, and j early January, first week of January 77. Two little tiny victories. Do they turn the war? No. But they save the war. At Trenton, and for many of you who are going, uh, uh, who have been to Washington, D.C., you've been to the Capitol building and you've been to the Rotunda, I suppose. And if you've been to the Rotunda in Washington, D.C., in the U.S. Capitol, there is a big portrait of Washington crossing the Delaware. Most of you have seen it maybe in a school book or something like that. Washington's got his chase, uh, chest stuck out. Um, Trenton, Trenton. The thing is, is that Washington has his chest stuck out, and it's an idealized portrait. It's actually has uh, very little historical value as far as the actual uh, particulars are concerned. But it is true that it was an extraordinarily cold night. The wind was blowing hard. It was, it, it was freezing, and the men, many of whom were half naked seemingly, many of whom had no shoes. Please put that in your notes. They had no shoes. So you will see, and it is a true statement, you will see men marching in the snow, blood in the snow sort of thing. That's how harsh this situation was. And they're going to cross a Delaware River that did have flowing ice, uh, it had flowing, uh, ice in it. Uh, it was half frozen. So when we talk about crossing uh, the Delaware, Washington crossing the Delaware very famously, uh, it was a perilous night. It was a fraught night. There on Christmas Eve, Christmas morning, very early Christmas morning, 1776. 
And what Washington and his little ragtag army were going to attack was not the whole of the British army. They picked out a soft target, to use a term. They pick out Hessians who tradition holds that they were drunk. They weren't, but they were caught by surprise, and Washington and his men are going to be there. Um, it's a little victory, but it's a victory all that they needed. And when word gets of that victory back to Benjamin Franklin in in uh, France, who by this point in time is a diplomat in France, Wash uh, Franklin will blow this victory up into a great victory, and it convinces the French to keep uh, stringing us along. But we needed some sort of victory, and we got two of them, Trenton and Princeton, in the last uh, days of and the first week of 1776 and 77. Um, you can go into great detail about it. I won't. I've already kind of done so, but uh, those, were, those were tough times. 1777 marks the beginning of uh, the, some more hard years and some more hard times. The thing is, is that uh, uh, the uh, thing is, is that we. I just saw something go by on my phone. I had to look over at it. The thing about um, the um, seven year 1777 is you're going to have the turning point in the American Revolution, and George Washington is nowhere to be found. The turning point in the American Revolution takes place in September, late September, early October of 1777. The turning point in the American Revolution are the battles for Saratoga, Saratoga, New York. What had happened was is that uh, the British had become increasingly frustrated with their inability to stop the American Revolution. It seemed like it was a revolution that would never quite die out. The British believed, with some justification, that the war should have been over by then. But it wasn't. So the British, uh, William Howe and Gentleman John Burgoyne, Gentleman Johnny, are going to settle upon a big plan. It's called a pincer movement, like two pincers on an anvil's on an uh, ant. The, um, the fact of the matter is, is that the British are going to send an army down south, Gentleman John Burgoyne, give me a second to... When you look at the geography of New York State, it should become very obvious, especially if you have a topographical type map. You can tell where the peaks and the valleys are. And one of the great valleys in New York State is, of course, the Hudson River Valley. The Hudson River runs from upstate New York and empties into New York City for all intents and purposes. The Hudson River is the uh, is a natural dividing line between New England to the east and everything else to the south and west. The British under Burgoyne ca uh, conceived of a plan that basically thought that the American Revolution was mostly supported in New England and that if the British could pair off and split away New England, the rest of the American Revolution, the rest of the colonies would just drop the revolution and move on with life. So the, the goal is, by Burgoyne and Howe, to come down and up the river and split New England away. We recognize that. We find that out, and we cannot allow that to happen. You cannot allow that to take place. You cannot allow um, the country to split be split apart like that. You've, in the American Civil War, it happens to the Confederates in 1863 at Vicksburg, and the Confederacy is frankly never the same again. Saratoga is also going to be the moment in the sun for the worst and another one of these un-American uh, un Americans. Benedict Arnold was the sort of man who makes enemies. Benedict Arnold was the sort of man, he was almost like at times a uh, Harley Davidson salesman, but much better. But what I mean by that is he makes his enemies, he's uh, a braggart, he's conceited, he's cocky, he's good at what he does, which is combat, and he's also a bit slippery. Arnold was an egomaniac, maybe a megalomaniac. But Benedict Arnold had earned his spurs. Benedict Arnold nearly froze to death up in Canada on the doorsteps of Montreal. Benedict Arnold had served his nation well. Benedict Arnold's from Connecticut, FYI. He's from, uh, I think, Norwich. But anyways, he is from Connecticut. And Arnold, oh yeah, Benedict Arnold's a traitor. We hadn't got there yet. He's got to do, uh, we got to get there. But Benedict Arnold, before he's a traitor, Benedict Arnold's a, a, a saint. Okay, he's not a saint, literally, but he is a patriot of the First Order. 
Yet, the problem is, is that he has ambition coming out of his ears and he's not afraid to step on other people to get what he wants. And so Arnold makes enemies left and right. He makes them all over the place. Arnold, making his enemies, is going to uh, be sidelined in the battles for Saratoga. There's, there's one that takes place on September 17th, and his memory serves. The other one takes place on, let me see if I've got it written down right in front of me. The battles for Saratoga, the other one takes place in early October, about October 9th. So uh, for us, what we're most interested in, the first battle for, around Saratoga is a British victory. But the second battle for Saratoga is called Bemis Heights. And it was there that the American commander, a man named Horatio Gates, Horatio Gates, Gates, Horatio Gates is a able commander, not a great one. Horatio Gates, along with uh, some of the other officers, can't stand Arnold. And they tell G Arnold, Gates specifically tells General Arnold, says, General Arnold, you have no command today, stay out of the battle. But Arnold was like Washington. Arnold was like Washington. Please put that in your notes. Like some of those great men of history, great military chieftains of history, you see it with Lee to a degree, you see it with uh, Napoleon, you see it with Patton, you go on down the list, it's quite lengthy. But there are always those men who run to the sound of battle, and the, uh, the cannon, boom, they go. Same for uh, Ulysses S. Grant, too. When the second battle for Saratoga at Bemis Heights uh, takes place, in October 77, Arnold was supposed to stay in his tent under effectively house arrest. Arnold slips arrest, jumps on a horse, dressed in his general's uniform, rides into battle. And Arnold was one of those strange men and one of those great men on, on the battlefield who can look around and, and can just, where everything looks like chaos, smoke, flame, people dead and dying, he can look around and it doesn't affect him. He, he's got this mind, Arnold does, and he can look around and he say, the great ones have it. And he, he was great in this sense. He could look around and say, that's the distinctive, uh, that is the strategic heights. That is the strategic point. We've got to take it or we've got to hold it, but whatever it is, however, whatever we got to do, that's where we have to be. And he rode onto the battlefield that day at the nick of the moment you find American troops starting to waver and crack under the pressure of the British, and they were cracking. Arnold rides into combat with no authority to do anything, rallies American troops. They take a strategic hill there at Bemis Heights, and it changes the whole battle. It wins the battle. It wins Saratoga. Folks, it's a turning point in the whole American Revolution. Benedict Arnold, who is most conspicuous and most well-known for being a traitor, Benedict Arnold is the man maybe most responsible for winning the battle that turns the war. He, by the way, gets shot in the leg, and Arnold catches a bullet right in the thigh, not just the thigh, but it cracks his femur. I don't know if any of you playing sports, uh, probably a few of you did, but ever catch a, a helmet in the thigh? or something like that, probably one of the more painful things that you could ever uh, imagine. Now, the bullet goes in. They wanted to amputate his leg, and he basically said, no, you're not going to take my leg, and he had it in a box. This leg was basically in a, a painful box to set it, and he walks on it for the rest of his life. Arnold's left leg was about an inch shorter than his right leg, but, oh, his men they saw it, and they loved him. Oh, his fellow officers hated him. But Arnold was quite the peacock. But that is the turning point in the American Revolution. It was here that Franklin was able to, uh, Clark Garcia, uh, Bemis Heights, the his name of the second battle. The, uh, it was here at the battles for Saratoga at Bemis Heights that Franklin, the great conjurer as Adams called him, Franklin was able to convince the French, help us out aid us. And the French are going to shower money. They're going to shower supplies. They're going to shower guns. They're going to shower troops. The French are going to shower even naval support upon the American Revolution, without which we could not have won the revolution. So who's to say that you don't have a, uh, a traitor have his uh, day in the sun, as it were? So 
The thing is, is that when we, we talk about Arnold, it doesn't mean that everything just turns out fine because you still have years to go in the war. Perhaps the darkest part of the whole war is this right next, and this is where I'll end the day. Boy, this is negative Debbie Downer territory, I think, isn't it? Everything's like, boy, this is bad. This guy's horrible. Negative, negative, negative. Many of you have heard the term Valley Forge. Valley Forge is maybe, the, in a sense, the darkest days for the Continental Army. To be captured and held at Valley Forge, excuse me, not to be captured, but to be held at Valley Forge for the winter quarters of, of December 1777 to June of 1778 was a long six months. First thing to remember about Valley Forge is that it's not that cold, and therein lies the problem. And when we think of Valley Forge, because you think of people dying in frostbite and exposure, which did happen, you think, oh my gosh, it was Siberia comes to Pennsylvania. Valley Forge is in eastern Pennsylvania, close to the, uh, within, a, not, within an earshot of the Delaware River, well, at least 20 miles, 30 miles. You would think that it was like Siberia, absolutely just back-breaking cold. It's not. It's muddy. It's wet and it's muddy. Now, for most of us Texans, we don't know uh, what mud's like. I mean, we know what mud's like, but cold mud, 30-degree mud, 35-degree mud. We don't know that because it doesn't get that cold here. But that was what made it worse because all the roads were muddy and they were sloshy. The problem, too, with being in Valley Forge was is that you were, especially if you're an enlisted man, you're camping out or you're in, in cabins that are notoriously germ-infested. Please put that in your notes. These cabins are horrible for measles and mumps. They're horrible for tuberculosis and uh, smallpox. Now, they did not, well, that was not really a bad outbreak. i got to be careful when I say that. But if you want to talk about getting sick pneumonia, you could certainly get it there at Valley Forge. Also, you never didn't stink. You never didn't stink because those cabins were poorly constructed because they hacked them out of a wilderness. And the, oh, what do you call those things? The chimneys were not drafting well. They did not draft, and so they were always smoky. So you smelt like a fire. And oh, by the way, the, the pests were everywhere. Scabies, lice, bed bugs. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced uh, any of those there. I imagine some of you have the bed bugs anyways. But the scratching and the itching, and they just called it the itch in that army. It would, especially right around the groin, is that these men would scratch and scratch to the blood flowed. It was horrible stuff. And you will find men at times who are without clothes to speak of. They're all rags. And without shoes, they're all rags. The Continental Army was dysfunctional. Continental Congress, excuse me, was dysfunctional. They weren't getting paid. And oh, by the way, the food. Here's the food. Put this in your notes. The Continental Congress had no money, and what money they had was given to them by the French, but that was often insufficient. So the Continental Congress issues what are called Continental do Dollars, basically, Continental Script, paper money that had no value. The British had money. They had specie, and so the British could get better food, and they could get better wagoneers. We couldn't. And so our freighters, our wagoneers, our teamsters would buy or would pick up the cheaper meat that we would get in barrels that would have been brined, which is a preservative. And in order to lighten the load on the wagons to help take care of, make their, uh, the, the trek easier for their mules and their horses, these teamsters would drill holes into the bottom of the barrels uh, filled with brine and brined beef, and that brine would drain out. And by the time the barrels would get to the army, well, the, the beef was rotted. The beef was putrid, and we still served it to the men. So it made them sick, if not kill them occasionally. When they got good food, they got what was called fire cake. Fire cake. What is fire cake? Water and flour. What's the nutritional value of fire cake? Not a thing. So these men complained at times, and they had a right to complain. I did nothing but scratch, itch, freeze, and 
my in, my insides, my intestines felt like they had a paste in them because they ate the fire cake. The only redeeming thing out of the whole hellish experience in that cold uh, Pennsylvania te- territory called Valley Forge was the introduction of a man who was probably also a liar. Well, there's more liars and cutthroats and traitors today than you can imagine. And that man's name is the Baron von Steuben. The Baron von Steuben, Frederick Baron von Steuben, he train, He shows up in January of 1778, and uh, he comes to Philadelphia, or actually it was Annapolis at that point. He gives, uh, he gets a commission. He goes to the army, and he says, "I can train your army, General Washington." Baron von Steuben, give me a second, and I will. Sp- the Baron von Steuben is short. He knows like six words in English. Everything else is in German. And if you've ever heard German spoken, it sounds like they're about to. Uh, even you could say, "I love you." I could say, I love you to Reagan right now in German. And I don't know if your roommates can actually hear that in the background, Reagan. I was hoping they can't. Okay, they can't. Oh, darn. Dang. I was hoping I could uh, uh, turn your red a little bit. The thing is, is that even if I said, I love you to my wife, Miss, the beloved Miss Gloria, she who must be obeyed in all things. You tell her I said that, too, if you ever run into Miss Gloria. But if I said it to her in, Eng- in German, it sounds like I'm about to march on Poland or something of that nature. But when it comes to uh, the uh, the Baron, he knew like five. Excuse me, that, that's not five. That's six. I got to count six words in English, five of which were profanity. So you can imagine this Baron. He's moving these men around and training them, and he's cussing at them in in German or and in English. And it just on and on. He's rolling, and, and and those who watched it said it was really quite, quite funny. It's about the best thing you can say. To wrap it up, it's 5.28 as I'm recording this. To wrap it up, though, the Baron's uh, contribution is immense. Coming out of nowhere, as it were, he probably was not actually a Baron, nor was he an officer, but he had served in the the Prussian Army. But what Baron von Steuben does, and it uh, grows out of his efforts, is the American Continental Army becomes an army, becomes a disciplined army, and they start to stick in battle, and they start to fight better and better. But what we'll finish up on the next lecture is we're going to finish up with a war. We'll get the war won, we'll get uh, Arnold's treason, and we'll have the southern strategy that that leads us to the end of the war at Yorktown. And that is a good place for me to hit the stop button.